The Lord be with you. I think I'm, are we? Help if I turned it on. There we go. And Merry Christmas, which, how many people have already taken their tree down? How many are holding on for another week or so? Yeah. <laughs> hey, good. <laughs> Bonnie said just the other day, she's like, uh, it's too busy before Christmas to enjoy it. At least give me a couple weeks after Christmas to enjoy it. And indeed, it still is Christmas. This is the, the 12th day of Christmas. If you want to go by the song, this is on the last day of Christmas. It's Epiphany. It's the end of the Christmas story as we talk about uh, the wise men and their visit to uh, the babe of Bethlehem as they come there to, to worship and praise. And uh, we'll think about them this morning and what role do they have for us in, in our worship. We're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. And a special welcome to our visitors. Uh, we're glad that you're here to join us this morning. We'd be privileged if you would use one of the information cards in your pew to share more about yourself that we then in turn could share more about the programs and the ministries of our congregation. Lots going on, and we certainly direct you to the back of your bulletin for uh, announcements as a number of things uh, are kicking off new in this new year. Uh, I know I just started this morning a, a new Bible study on conflict, um, and everyone who does not have conflict in their lives is excused, which means, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, we all are challenged by it. How do we deal with it in a God-pleasing way? What are some, some strengths? What are uh, some opportunities? What are the challenges? What are practical solutions uh, to deal with conflict in a, in a God-pleasing way? We'll be doing that at 9.15 during uh, our Sunday school hour. Uh, Roger Kinsey's class continues as they're uh, working through the book of uh, Genesis. And uh, how are we doing? Is the earth flooded yet? Or we got through the flood, that's good. Kid the knife in the fire, all right. Um, we're at least up to Abraham, that's good. That's a good, good place to be. <laughs> and uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, and what, again, practical uh, insights uh, for, uh, for life as we look at uh, Genesis, as well as our Sunday school continuing as well. Uh, another wonderful aspect and project um, Ministry of our Christian education is our February Sunshine uh, Vacation Bible School program. And I really was wondering why Pastor Day was sitting with a teddy bear in the... So now I get to find out. This is Buster, and Buster can't wait for February Sunshine. And February Sunshine is our Vacation Bible School, the big bulletin board, has the dates and the times. It's February 19th through the 21st. Big kids, little kids, it's a national park theme. We're going to learn about Jesus every day. So, Buster and I want to see all of you sign up and come learn about Jesus. Sign-ups are available. On the bulletin board, and Sunday school teachers have the registration forms, and it's on the church website, too. Awesome. Lots of different ways. Uh, certainly a, a wonderful ministry for our congregation, for our community. Do you have neighbor kids, uh, grandkids, others that uh, would like to join us for those days? Uh, we're in need of everything from cookie bakers to helpers to students. Yep. I got the routine down? Yep. We'll all right. Them all. Big and small, we'd like you all. So come to February Sunshine. Nice. You've been working on that. <laughs> and, a, and a special thank you to, to Sue and her team, and particularly Sue in general, uh, uh, for stepping up and leading this important ministry, and we thank her uh, for that. If you have uh, questions about volunteering or more questions about the program, uh, see Sue Dietschy. As we uh, worship this morning and as we uh, celebrate God's love, we, we think about the wonderful theme of, of light, uh, that Christ is the light of the world. That's why we have uh, uh, our lights on the Christmas tree. It's the celebration of that theme on our bulletin cover this morning, to bring light for everyone, uh, not just the star of Bethlehem, um, but the light of the world in the manger, Christ, and that is uh, who we are here to worship this morning. Uh, our worship is printed out for us in our bulletin. Uh, I'd like to invite us to rise. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'd like to invite us to rise for our invocation in our uh, opening sentences uh, on page one and two. We begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your righteousness. May all kings fall down before him. Knowing uh, indeed that God is our light and that we come to him this morning, uh, we confess our sins to God, uh, seeking his forgiveness, uh, his mercy, his strength for our daily life. Compassionate Father, standing in the light of your word, we are humbly aware of your holiness and need to be honest about the darkness of our sinful hearts. We do not walk in the light as you are in the light, but instead seek the cloak of darkness to hide our sins from the truth of your righteous judgment. For the sake of Jesus, the light of the world, hear our confession and forgive our sins. Send your Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts through your word and grant us strength to do your will. Through Christ our Lord, who suffered, died, and rose again, that we would have eternal life. Amen. God hears our confession, illuminates our darkness, and embraces us with divine mercy for Jesus' sake. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite us to rise for the reading of our Holy Gospel. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In response to God's word, we join together making profession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried 
And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and descended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I said, here we are, the, the last day of Christmas. Uh, we'll take down the, the tree and the wreaths and the banners after worship. And if you're willing to stick around and help, I know Dorothy wouldn't mind a little extra help uh, taking that down afterwards. And there we all put it away. But it's still Christmas today, and we have the, the wonderful story presented in, in Matthew of the wise men, the magi, the three kings. Now, i got to say that at one level, this should be a very easy Sunday to preach. Because there is so much material written about this episode, these 12 verses, than I think almost anything else, at least in the Gospel of Matthew, outside of Jesus' death and resurrection. There are so many things out there, and so many different articles and speculations. It starts with this, this star. And what was it? Was it a miracle? Or was it some kind of God-ordained but naturally occurring event, a supernova, for example, that was just so unusually bright, and those who, who watched the skies knew that that must mean something. And yet, how would that star actually guide them into Bethlehem, into the specific house? It said it stopped over the place where he was, and that doesn't sound like a supernova, so what could that actually be? And yeah, oh, by the way, who are these men, these magi? You know, the other time it occurs in the New Testament, we actually use the word about a sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, Simon Magus, which would be singular for magi. So are these good people or, or bad people? And where did they actually come from? Because we're pretty sure they didn't come from the Orient, uh, probably from Persia, but we don't actually know. And how long did it take them to get there? And when they got there, why did they know? How did they even know how to go to Jerusalem in the first place? And how would they know that this all meant something? How were they in tune that they could actually listen to this dream afterwards and know not to go back? And then we have this whole question of the, these gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And what is myrrh anyway? And what is it used for? And why did they bring that? And why was that important? And how many wise men were there? Because we know there were three guests. We don't actually know that there were three wise men, yet later on they're named uh, and given names hundreds of years later. I'm just scratching the surface. So you'd think there would be plenty of material to work with, except so far, what haven't I mentioned? Jesus. We've mentioned everything else and all of these speculations about star and the wise men and Herod, the gifts and the camel and the trip. And where was Jesus and was he in a house and he had been in a house before and now he's in a house. And... But we never mentioned Jesus. And yet, I think that's also very exemplary of some one of the issues that sometimes we all struggle with as Christians. We get wrapped up in everything around Jesus and don't actually put enough focus 
on Jesus. It's not that the wise men are bad. It's not that the star was bad. God sent the star. They brought the gifts. None of those things are bad. It's just that they get so much focus, we miss the main person in the story. But don't we as church often have that challenge of doing the same thing? When the things around church get the focus instead of Christ, the head of the church. You see, what happens so often is we just kind of get used to doing it and used to being it and almost miss that it has distracted us. Former president of the seminary attended called it one example of it, the idolatry of worship. That we can actually begin to worship worship instead of worshiping Christ. And the how I worship becomes more important in my head than who I worship. Let me give a couple examples. The great debate over music. Ugh. All yeah. All of us have preferences, don't we? Music is good. Music is for God's praise. It's for God's glory. It allows us to express our faith and prayer and praises to the Lord. But when the music isn't the style I want, and I find myself unable to worship, has the style of music become in my heart more important than the one to whom I'm singing? For some of us, the danger is yes. Yes. Very intentionally, recently, I'm not wearing an all. Some of us love that. Some of us don't like that. The challenge is that sometimes the focus can be so much on what I wear, and to be quite honest, very pastorally, when I found out it was a problem, I made sure and continued to do it. It was a very thought-filled decision because to challenge you to not put the focus on what we wear and instead of on the one we worship. The challenge sometimes becomes we change the style of how we re receive communion. Should I kneel? Should I stand? How do we come past? And I can't do it if we do it this way. And does the style of how we do something become more important than the one we're about to receive, Christ, in his body and blood? We do it all the time. We, we, we come in and we enjoy fellowship and relationships with one another. And we come for the social aspect of church and miss the vertical aspect of my relationship with Christ. The focus can become activities. The focus can become service. The focus can become business. All these different things that surround church, from activities to, to all the different things that we are, but that gets so much focus that we actually lose focus on Christ. And that's the danger in this analysis of epiphany. I'm so worried about the wise men and about the star and about how this happened and all these details that I actually miss Jesus. And it very intentionally, Matthew has recorded the story. In fact, Matthew is the only one of the four Gospels that records epiphany. He barely even, he does more on epiphany than he did on Christmas. And Luke, who did this entire workup of pre-Christmas and then Christmas, doesn't even do Epiphany. Why is it that it was so important for Matthew to make sure that this was recorded when he recorded almost nothing else about Christmas? And the answer is because in doing so, 
He was actually making sure and pointing us to Christ, not away. Remember, as they came, he's very intentional about recording that these kings, these wise men came. And when they come to Herod's temple, what do they do? They inquire, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law point them to Scripture, to Micah 5. Say, look. There's a promise, and this promise is to be fulfilled in Bethlehem. God's word is coming true in Christ. These wise men knew the prophecy that a star would rise up out of Jacob, and that star would signal the birth of the Messiah. We know that the fulfillment of our Old Testament lesson is true. Arise, shine, for your light has come. But not the light of the star, the light of the world. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you. All nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of of your rising. Jesus is there as the fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. For thousands of years, since the very fall into sin, he's been working out this plan, this solution to that problem of sin and rebellion. And the answer is in Christ. And when the the wise men come, They're showing again the truth of all of these wonderful words from Scripture about how kings would come, how they would present gold and frankincense, how the worship would be oriented to him who had been born king. And indeed, isn't that why the wise men came? To worship. All nations shall come to your light. When that light has come, all of creation is to worship. All of creation is to praise, and all of creation is to make that light known. That's why Paul, when he rejoices in that same salvation message, that the light and the message of salvation had come to all people, then also reminds us of the role of the church. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known. The role of us as church is to worship and to make Christ known. That's our focus. Worshiping Christ and making him known. And all that we do, be it from worship to service to fellowship to the business of church to our relationships, all of that serves Christ. And It's not intended to get in the way, but actually intended to fulfill it. The challenge for us is to get our hearts to the very same place where Isaiah's heart was, Paul's heart was, where the heart of the wise men were, to worship. To worship Christ. To orient all that I do as a Christian, all that we do as church, on him. Keeping the extras, but always making sure that in my mind and in my heart, those are always servant to and subservient to Christ. The light of the world. The focus of our faith. The goal of our salvation. Jesus, the light of the world. In his name, amen.